Well, good evening, listeners. You're listening to Lament of Hope podcast, and I'm your host, Danielle Richardson. And I am so excited. Um, it's been so, it's been a journey for us to connect, but we're here and it's awesome. I'm getting to talk with children's author Natalie Lloyd. Um, and for those of my listeners who love children's books, which I know there are several of you who do, she has written um, A Snicker of Magic, um, The Hummingbird, and then just recently a new book that came out about a month ago as well that I have yet to read and I'm really looking forward to digging into. Um, but, you know, I was just talking to Natalie before this that children's books seem to resonate so much even as adults and i'm finding that the truths that are kind of simple in children's books are just so much more i guess they hit home so much more when you're an adult um because you always have to be reminded of simple truths but one thing that's really neat about the hummingbird just going back to her second book i want to mention is that it was the first book i had read where the protagonist had an illness, a chronic illness that was not healed by the end of the book. And I'm not trying to give away too much about it because I want you to read it, but the um, protagonist has to kind of find her identity outside of her illness, and her illness is not something that miraculously is healed and goes away. And I think that's just such a powerful... I never came across that in a book before. Just a powerful thing to wrestle with, especially as a child, but even as an adult who deals, lots of people deal with chronic illness and it doesn't get better or it doesn't go away and they live their life with that. And Natalie knows about that because she actually has brittle bone disease, which is what the protagonist in The Hummingbird has as well. So Natalie, first of all, thank you so much for taking this time. I'm so happy to have you here. Oh, thank you. I'm so excited to spend some time with you. So, you know, Natalie, first of all, I want to give you just a little space. Can you tell listeners about your third book? Um, obviously, it came out a, m- a month ago and, you know, kind of a little summary about it and and why you think people should read it. Absolutely. So, um, like you said, I'm Natalie. Sometimes my friends call me Nat and I write books for kids, which is absolutely my dream job. And I will say, even though they are technically for kids, um, often I meet adults who are surprised at how much they love books for kids, whether they read them with some of the littles in their life or they take a course on it in school and they realize, oh, this is really good. Or they remember what it's like when reading was fun when they were younger. So um, for me, this was always the pinnacle. I've always loved to write and I used to think, oh, maybe when I get really good someday, I can write books for kids. But I assumed I would have to be really, really old for that to happen because I knew they were the best of the best. And so I'm grateful that I get to do it. Uh, My first book was A Snicker of Magic, and that came out 10 years ago this year. And it still makes me so happy that people are discovering it for the first time. I know at events I've been to recently, I've met readers who got the book from older siblings. And that's a very surreal moment when I realize it's getting passed down a little bit. Um, And then I've been so, so blessed to be able to keep writing. Um, My newest book is called The Witching Wind, and that's book number nine for me. And it came out um, this year. It actually came out just a month ago. We're talking in October, and the book came out at the 1st of September. And this new one has some of the same themes I always go back to in my novels. You can probably tell by my accent, I'm a Southern girl. I grew up right in the heart of Appalachia, on the Tennessee Kentucky border. And so most of my stories are an Appalachian setting because I'm drawn to so much in that culture, the storytelling and the people and this intermingling of religion and superstition and passed down traditions, all these cool things you can write about are always in the same setting for me. And um, in this book, I write about family. This one's a little bit more about found family, not just the family members you have, but the ones you get to find as you go. And it Mm -hmm. centers around two characters, Roxy and Grayson, who live in a town where this mysterious wind blows through and steals stuff. And up until now, it has only stolen stuff, but suddenly people go missing. And two of those people belong to these girls. So they set out together to find their people and figure out what this mystery is behind the wind. So that's the magic and mystery that keeps it going. But there's a lot more in there about 
body image and how we connect to people and and the links we go to for the people we love. And I loved writing it. I'm so excited it's out in the world. Man, no, that sounds really good. You know, I I did want to ask you because it's something I noticed just reading two of your books. With a snicker of magic, your protagonist is always wanting a home, just really hungry for a stable home. Um, and kind of at the end, well, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Uh, like, <laughs> cannot tell the ending of these books. Um, and then in The Hummingbird, the protagonist, almost in a similar way, has a home, but is looking for kind of like her home, like settled home within herself of who she is. Um, you know, I wanted to ask you, you know, growing up or even now, did you find it hard to feel like either your identity, you struggled with just figuring out what your identity was, or did you, similar to the Snicker of Magic character, struggle to have like a stable home, like a home where you could stay? I love that those are the threads you pulled out because really at the heart of most of what I write, there is this deep desire for belonging, finding some place you fit in, some place you are okay to be exactly who you are. And a snicker of magic, like you said, it was a literal home. This girl has moved all over the place with her mom and her little sister, and they end up in this town that has some magic still hidden inside it. I did not move. I grew up in the very same town. My whole life, there was one chunk of road called the four lane because it was the only road that had four lanes in it. It was this really um, great tiny town to grow up in. But when I was writing a snicker of magic, I was very homesick. And I realized after looking inward, it wasn't so much for a place. That's what I thought, especially in my 20s. I kept thinking, oh, I just haven't found the physical place I belong yet. But mm -hmm. for me, it was more for the people in my life, especially my grandparents. Uh, when I was a kid, I spent so much time with them. And unlike school, where I never really felt like I fit anywhere, I always fit exactly the way I was when I was with my grandparents and with my parents. Home was that safe place for me. And I'm so grateful I can even look back and say that. But I wanted the character to get to experience what it was like when home was people and not just a place. And what it's like to feel at home in your body even is something that Hummingbird deals with a lot. Or like you said, she wants so bad to, even though she is happy at home, she wants to connect with a group of friends her own age. So in some ways that, that longing to belong never goes away for me. I always have to come back to the place where I remember um, what it's like to live authentically, to be with the people I love who love me for who I am. And I try to write that into my characters. But like me, sometimes they try to belong in, in all the ways that don't work as well. Well, you know, I wanted to ask, and, and you know, if you don't want to answer this, please do. But one thing that really stood out to me at the beginning of The Hummingbird um, was when um, Olive was at church and the woman came up to her and said, you know, in Jesus's name, be healed and be well. And that was kind of um, off-putting for Olive. Not so much because the woman was praying, but also, but so much as she was praying for healing and like she didn't know her and it was just really random. Um, you know, and that's something that I feel like the religious community in general you know, there, there is a lot and there is healing that does happen. Right. Um, Absolutely, but, yeah. but a lot of times there isn't, um, not the type of healing that's being prayed for and it's not wrong to pray for healing. That's not what I'm saying for people listening, but, you know, I wanted to ask you, did you ever have that experience yourself? Because I mean, having brittle bone disease, at least from what I understand, it's not something that goes away. It's maybe something that you can help live with better, but it's not going to go away. Did you ever have like people pray over you and, and say, you know, and, you know, to be healed like that? And for you, like, how did you react? Was that, did you accept that? Was that something you wanted to happen or how did that feel? I love that question. I am a person of faith. I'm a Christ follower. And saying that, um, I have so many friends in publishing and beyond, so many readers who are not people of faith or who are people of different faiths. And I hope they all feel safe in my books. I think there's a uh, But that definitely shelf. Um, there's a lot that comes with that, right? I mean, 
especially right now. We're in a very heated climate that can become toxic very quickly because of how faith or the idea of faith gets tangled in with what we say and do. And so as a kid, um, and even as a kid, I grew up going to church. I grew up around people who said they loved God. And I actually saw that lived out in really beautiful ways. People who took care of each other, people who were very open-hearted, open-minded and welcoming. But occasionally, of course, you have moments when it's not like that. And I think many people with chronic illness have had that experience where someone prays for you to be healed. And exactly like you said, I'm never offended when someone prays for me. Um, If someone asks me to pray for them, I'm honored to do that. But I think it's the way people look at you and regard you. And in that moment, it was this very showy, public out loud, you know, instead of praying quietly, if this character had felt led to do that, she had to make a scene in doing it. I think that was embarrassing for the character. That would be embarrassing for me also as a kid or an adult. Um, And also just this idea that, that you know what needs to be fixed in a person, that you are something to be fixed. And I think it bothers the character because she kind of has it in her head. Mm -hmm. If it weren't for this disability that I have, my life would be so much easier. And in some ways it would. That's something I've had to deal with a lot too. In some ways, when I'm not dealing with an actual broken bone, my life is easier. I can get in buildings easier. I don't need as much help. I'm not in pain. Um, and so chronic illness, it can really mess with your mind, especially if you're a person of faith. And I hope, um, you know, I, I didn't know how that would land with people because I am certainly not anti-prayer. I am a person who prays. Um, and I'm, like I said, honored to pray for people. People have prayed with me about different things in my life. But overall, what I hope that was an example of is not so much a genuine concern for someone or a genuine concern for where they're at spiritually. It was more um, someone just kind of wanting to show how sympathetic they were or something. It was just a little too show-offy in the moment. I don't know if that answers the question. No, no, it does. What for you has been the hardest experience you had regarding brittle bone disease like obviously the pain is very hard and I'm not even going to begin to say I understand that but what like human interaction was the most painful for you either something someone said to you about it or something that someone looked the way they looked at you like what was the most painful that you can remember I think Two of the moments that have been the most painful for me, besides what you said, just the physical pain, which everyone goes through, and there's no way we can compare our pain. We all feel it, and it's all so incredibly hard. And even though I'm incredibly thankful for the medical advances we have for all kinds of bone diseases and other diseases, pain is still a part of being human, and it really stinks to go through. It's so hard. It clouds your judgment. It clouds your thought process and your mind. It's so difficult. So that's definitely hard. I think one of the more painful moments for me came in middle school when I realized, okay, everybody around me is changing. All of my girlfriends are changing the way you do when you're a teenager and boys notice them. And I have been a hopeless romantic since I read Anne of Green Gables and read about Gilbert Blythe, right? Yeah. So I was <laughs> always like, so hopeful that would happen someday. And I think even at like 12 and 13, I started to worry like, oh, well, if my bones are always going to be breaking, if I have to use a wheelchair or walker, which I don't write at the second, but I do if I'm recovering from a fracture or because my body looks different, you know, my legs are bowed, um, which is very common. I have a large rib cage that's common with OI. I have pretty severe scoliosis. All of these ways, my body looks different. That's not the way other girls look different. What if nobody ever wants me? And I started to feel very invisible in the worst way. I could see the attention other girls got that I didn't get. And it absolutely broke my heart. And for Mm. a long time convinced me maybe, you know, maybe love doesn't happen. Maybe these big adventures that I'm hoping for in my life don't get to happen because my body is different. So um, again, I'm thankful I had family in my life speaking truth to me all along and friends who did the same thing because none of that is true. You know, all of that comes through your life. No matter how your body looks, you get to experience love and joy in the body you're in. Uh, But it was hard for me to realize that 
as a 12 or 13 year old. And so I kind of put that experience into Olive as well. Yeah. How did you meet your husband? Because didn't you recently, was it relatively recently married him? To me, it feels recent. We've been together seven years now. Okay. And it's funny because um, a friend of mine had started online dating and I was like, I can't do it. I will be the person who meets the Craigslist killer or something like that. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I just, yeah. But, and also I'd grown up in this small town where it just seemed to work out for people, right? Like people just kind of connected and I hadn't, but um, it was cool to be around people in publishing who are primarily really cool city girls in New York and hear about their dating experiences and meeting people online was just how they met people. There was nothing, you know, all that interesting about it. It was almost like an aside. And I thought, okay, if it works out for them and it's no big deal, I can try it. And I am so thankful I did. Um, we both joke with each other that we're the best thing the other has ever found online <laughs> because um, that's what it was. We lived in the same town. Um, and I think when you're an adult, and you're kind of a homebody like I am and like he is. Sometimes it is really hard to meet people. And so that was a perfect way for us to connect. And after that, we we couldn't stand to be apart. So we knew pretty quick that we were going to be together. Was it like, did you go on a few dates before? Or was he like the first person you met on the online dating site? He was the first person I went out with on the oh, site. Wow. Um, I had talked to a few other people, but I know I got so very lucky in that because there are there are so many experiences people have had online and not all of them are good but um once we actually started going out um it was wonderful he's I always say he's like Gilbert Blythe if Gilbert had sleeve tattoos and cussed a little <laughs> he's just this dreamy kind funny human he's that person in a room people gravitate toward and I'm not I'm in the corner of a room hiding out I'm very introverted and shy but he is so warm and welcoming and so I fell in love with him and my whole family fell in love with him pretty much at the same time they would have kept him no matter what so I'm glad it worked out did you worry at all while you were dating him about your body image was that something you like talked to him about or how did oh, you work absolutely through that? I ended up telling him before our first date because it was such, I would say, an obstacle in my mind. I was so convinced nobody would want me, you know, like like if they actually knew. Even though I had gone on dates before and been in relationships before, it was such a block for me. And so I told him about it's osteogenesis imperfecta is the actual name of the bone disease. I told him about that. I'm like, you know, there's a chance I could break again someday. Um, it could get worse as I get older. It may not change much. There are a lot of unknowns with this. And I have a lot of scars. My body looks different. And um, he was completely fine with it. He's like, hey, I'm strong. I can carry you if you ever need me to. That's not a problem. Oh. He's like, I think your scars are amazing. And so um, I think as cliche as it sounds, and I know there's a story in this too, not for middle grade readers, but someday if I write a little bit older, I don't think I've ever felt as beautiful as I do when I'm around him because he sees me as stronger than I see myself, not just physically, but it's like wow. he knows how to pull out all the good stuff. So he was worth it. Yeah, I would tell 13 year old me, it's totally fine if boys don't notice you now. <laughs> you are going to meet the very best guy. Well, when did you, how old were you when you met him? I was, let's see, we got married when he was, I think I was 35 when we started dating. So like maybe 36, 37 when we got married and he's five years older. Um, see, that is such that an helped. encouragement because I, so yeah. many girls I've talked to, single girls are like 25, 26, kind of similar to you. You know, where I live, it's kind of like in, you know, we're in this area that's like 50 minutes outside of D.C., but it's like everyone knows each other and people find each other really fast. And <laughs> then I have these single friends who I love um, and they are like, I've not found anybody. I, I'm 25. I'm 26. And I've got all these friends who are having babies and they're getting their house and they're married. And I'm like still sitting here you know, not sure what I'm doing with my life, trying to figure out what to do. And they're like, I don't think I'll ever meet anyone. And and it's been so 
it's so encouraging to me when I get to meet people that met someone later in life and be able to go, no, you, like people meet at any time. And so being 25 or 26, 27, whatever, it doesn't mean you're behind. But I think Absolutely that's a not. huge... I mean, to be honest, I think that's even, I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm over speaking here, but a societal thing. It's like, if you haven't found somebody when you're young, like you're just not going to find anybody. And so you might as well, you know, pour yourself into your career or something because it's, it's over, you know? Oh my gosh. It's so true. And I remember being there and feeling it. I remember being in the season when it was constant wedding invites and people having babies and then people buy houses. And it's like, how did everybody else get the checklist for life and check it off at exactly, you know, what I perceived to be the right time. And I felt like I had just missed the boat because there were so many uncertainties. And, and there are times I tell him, and I mean it, like, I wish I could have found him sooner. Like, why didn't we get to meet when we were younger? And we'll never know why. But I know we met at a time that was perfect for us. Um, and it's, it's pretty darn fun to be in a newlywed phase, like, no matter when it happens, age has no bearing on how happy you get to feel when you fall in love. So I remember those years and they are really tough, but, um, but if all of that meant having this now, they were worth it. You know, Natalie, I, I wanted to ask you and, and cause I, I don't think when I was reading and researching about you, you don't have any kids, right? We don't have kids. We just have three spoiled dogs <laughs> and we strive to be everybody's favorite aunt and uncle. We love our nieces and nephews a lot, but we don't have children. Are you, is it because of the brittle bone disease you can't have children? That's definitely one of the reasons. Physically, it would be really hard, if not impossible, to carry a child, especially because of the way my scoliosis is. So, yeah. Um, we would definitely have a family a different way if we did. And we're always open to each other and the dogs and having family over all the time. But I think we're on the same page. And if we both felt like like we wanted children, I mean, it would be cool to have kids with him. But I'm also extremely happy where we are. So we're both yeah. open to it and we're both happy where we are, if that makes sense. But it definitely does. I mean, my de my disability definitely plays into that decision for sure. Does that bother you at all or not really? You know, it doesn't. And I'm so thankful because I have friends who would have been brokenhearted. That was the dream of their hearts to be a mom and to experience carrying a child. And when I found out I couldn't, um, I, I wasn't upset over it. I remember thinking, okay, well, that's just not what it's going to look like if I become a parent. It's going to look different for me. So I'm really thankful my mind and my body were totally in agreement on that. And I don't know why that is because I've gone through some really sad and heartbroken days with friends who felt differently, but thankfully that wasn't my experience. You know, it's so interesting though, is that in your books, especially you seem to know children so well and like the struggles that they have and the, um, insecurities and I mean obviously you were a child once too so it's not like you know you completely forget that but it seems like you know what it's like to be a child even now maybe more intimately than a lot of adults do because parents in some sometimes and it just happens can become removed right because they're parents now sure. and they're they're trying to raise their kids and and help them to choose the right things and, and become people that are kind and compassionate and helpful. And so it's so easy to kind of forget what it was like as that kid and having those emotions and those feelings and like experiencing stuff for the first time. Um, so in some ways, I mean, for you, like getting to write all these books about children, I mean, it almost feels like, I guess, that you have an outlet you almost have like your own kids in a way because all these characters you're kind of building and making in these books oh I love that image um and I love that that you feel like the emotions ring true because I want them to you from the time as long as I can remember I have had very big feelings Thanks. 
for you when I was a kid and life made me feel and not just sad or happy or excited. Um, but even, even what it was like, you know, how I felt when I was around my favorite people, like that moment when somebody you love walks back into a room or when people notice something you've done that you're proud of. Like lately, I've been working on this new project and I've been thinking a lot about a teacher who encouraged my writing early on. And what a big deal that was for me to have someone validate this thing that was this very, you know, private part of my heart for so long that I kind of wanted to share. So I'm not sure why I still have that line to who I was then other than to say maybe there are parts of my heart that haven't changed as I've gotten older. Um, I think age can make us a little bit more cynical if we're not careful. I think, you know, it's easy to get a little less hopeful when we get older and writing from a younger perspective reminds me to stay in that hope space and to see possibility and potential everywhere. There's an author I was telling you about just before we started this conversation. Her name's K.A. Holt, and she says, we're all just kids in grown-up skin. And I think that's another reason adults read books for middle grade readers or young adults, and they connect to them because it's like, oh, I still feel this way sometimes. I still want somebody to save me a seat in the cafe. Cafeteria. You know, I still want to find my people that I get to be my weirdly wonderful self around and don't have to change a thing for. So those deep down needs and desires we have, I think they're still true as we get older. And it also helps to have an editor who helps me. My books go through so many drafts trying to get to the truest feelings I can get into a book. Um, it's one thing to play with all the magic, and I love it, but I hope what the character feels is what rings true with people. Oh, no. I mean, it, it certainly does. I mean, Good. I, you know, I was going to ask you, too, though, don't you think now, it's interesting when you were saying that, you know, when you become an adult, you become more cynical in some ways, which is true. But also, I think kids nowadays grow up faster. Like, they don't oh, get the absolutely experience really quickly you know it's funny I've I'm reading another kid's book now by an author I can't remember her name and one of the characters you know is this young girl but because of all these struggles she's gone through she has this paragraph in the book where she's talking about you know I should be a kid and I should be able to dream and I should be able to play but instead I'm worrying about finances I'm worrying about my mom I'm worrying about her health I'm worried about how of displeasing her and ruining everything and then there's like this sentence of like but I'm supposed to be a kid and I technically am but I'm not and you know I just I don't know if you feel this way but like since you've grown and like what you've seen kids don't really have that childhood period very very often like it goes by super quick way faster I remember even I've had kids come up to me and talk to me about stuff. And I'm like, how do you know about this? You know, you're like seven. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's awful, but it's so, it's like that enchanting experience in your books is becoming less and less of what kids actually experience now. Yes. And I'm so glad you brought it up. I know for me, it's something I think about a lot is how do I stay aware of what's happening in the world and not let a 24-7 news cycle crush my spirit, right? How do I, you know, exist as somebody who has anxiety and I'm treated for it very successfully, but how do I not set that off with everything going on and not just in the world, but just the sadness you feel in life. And sometimes people tell me there are um, too many hard things in my books. The characters go through too many sad things, but I think to exist means you're going through hard things. You have yeah. all this hard stuff happening and all this wonderful stuff, and you're always learning how to hold it all at the same time. And I totally agree with what you said. I don't know that kids now get that same extended time we did. I mean, when I was a kid, there was no internet. This is in the late 1900s, as they say, there was no internet. You know, we were constantly making up stuff to play. And there are great parts about technology, but there are also really scary, hard parts as well. Or when I do school visits now, it's so interesting because usually when I'm doing a school visit, it's kids who are like in third to sixth grade. And these really tiny girls will carry in their giant Stanley water bottles. And you 
you know, they're wearing like cute little Lululemon outfits. I mean, basically they're dressed like grownups already. And I remember projecting myself into the future, right? I couldn't wait to grow up. It seemed so cool. But I also, I played a long time when I was a kid, probably way longer than kids do now. Or if, if you have nieces and nephews or kids, something I've noticed is they like to watch people play, like videos of people play, but they don't actually play it's just a whole different way to interact with the world and and I hope for kids who feel that way whether you know it's just nature that makes them grow up fast or like the character in the story you're talking about and I have one similar in the witching wind there's um, one of my characters is in the foster system and so she's had to grow up really quickly I hope um, my books can give them a little space where they get to just kind of rest in the enchantment for a minute. There are hard things the characters go through and have to overcome, but there's also magic. And and this is a little spoilery, but not too much. At the end, you always see them all together. They found their people and you know they're going to be okay, even if things haven't completely worked out the way you wanted them to. Yeah. Do you, I mean, I know, you know, with the school visits you've had, I mean, you probably met a lot of kids. What do you think is something that, helps that can help kids kind of hold on to that childhood a little longer or something that parents potentially can do to encourage their children in the imagination kind of sphere as someone who isn't a parent all I can say is I am blown away by what a great job parents are doing getting through a pandemic um, not that it's not still a thing but the way they had to figure out how to keep kids engaged and social like I can't imagine the stress that came with that and more often than not it's really rare I don't come back from a school visit and just talk about how wonderful these kids are um, the way their parents or their adults in their life whoever their guardians are and their teachers are calling out their creativity and their quirkiness and their art and I love that so I would just say whatever you're doing well done and great job I can't imagine how hard it is to be a teacher or a parent right now but when I'm around kids I see what a great job you're doing in a really hard time we're living in yeah it's true. What is your fondest memory as a kid? Oh, like from childhood or just yeah, from as a childhood. kid? Gotcha. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, so the one that comes to mind first is on Christmas Eve, we used to go to my mama and papa. That's what we called them in Tennessee. We used to go to their house. All of my cousins would be there, all my aunts and uncles, and it was just a bunch of people telling stories and laughing, and there was so much chatter, um, and the house smelled like baked bread, which is like the most comforting smell in the world, and sometimes my grandpa would get out his guitar and play it, and that memory, that excitement leading up to that night, I think somehow I put that in every novel I write, even though I've never written that exact scene. It's like I had everything I love, my people, music, um, people all together, carbs, <laughs> like all the good stuff, all in one space. Uh, that's one of my happiest memories. What kind of food do you like? What's your favorite food? Oh my gosh. So I, I would use the excuse that it's because I write kids novels. Really pretty much everything I like is terrible for me. Um, I drink way too much coffee. <laughs> um, I, I love Mexican food. We do that a lot. Um, we do pizza. Um, there, I, I like more things that I used to. I was an incredibly picky eater growing up, but um I, I'm not super adventurous when it comes to food, but but I try. Do you like pasta? I love pasta. Yes. Yeah. So like mac and cheese pasta or like spaghetti? Uh, both. I've never met a pasta I don't like as of yet. Um, <laughs> but I am a fan of mac and cheese. And it's so fun when my nephew comes over, he loves just plain noodles, nothing on them. So we'll just do like this big bowl of noodles. He is just a kid after my own heart because I could see loving that when I was a kid. Now I feel like the more cheese, the better, you know, I am pro cheese, but, yeah. um, but as a kid, I was a picky eater too. So that's kind of fun. Now, I, as far as I understand, you haven't written a book about your life per se, right? Like a memoir. I haven't. 
yet. Um, I'm working on a graphic novel right now. It's my very first one. And I'm just doing the story part that is in words. The illustrated story part will be done by somebody who is actually qualified to do that part. And that's about a particular thing that happened when I was in middle school. But other than that, I've never done a memoir. I just like to tuck it all into fiction. So um, like I said, the feelings are real, even if the setting is imagined and, and heightened a little bit as far as the fantastical elements go. But there's a lot of truth in what I write, even the fictional stuff. Do you think you'd ever write one, a memoir? You don't think so? I don't think so. I mean, I never say never. I mean, you never know. Any kind of art you make, sometimes you don't get to pick what is really going to spin up your imagination and that thing, that story that has to be told and you can't wait to tell it. But so far for me, fiction is what does that. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that's probably where I'll stay. But like I said, you never know. If you did, what would you call it? Gosh, I'm so terrible with titles. Like my editor has to help me brainstorm titles every time. So I don't know. I think I would probably take it back to Narnia somehow. I'm a big fan of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. That was one of those keystone books that hmm. not just made me a reader for life, but gave me so much courage and so much hope. So I might call it Roar or Following the Lion. or I, That sounds kind of corny. I would have to think about it, but I would probably try to sneak Aslan into the title somewhere. Why did you like Aslan so much? I, and I did not even realize... I guess I did. I know there's a religious connection to it, right? I know C.S. Lewis was a Christ follower as well. And you read the book and you know, some of it's allegorical, but I don't think that's what drew me to it as a little kid. I loved the adventure behind it. And I love thinking there was this one character in this book who was good, a little bit confusing, but good. Like there's a part when he says, you know, I'm not always safe, but I'm good. And, you know, evil couldn't stand up against it. All the dark shadowy stuff couldn't stand up against him. Death came along and that couldn't even take him down. And also just the image of a lion seems like such a strong and wild kind of image to me. Um, a story I tell a lot, and it's very true, is that when I used to break bones as a kid, one of the things I would do in my imagination is pretend I was with Aslan. I would pretend I was like holding his fur or that I could hear his roar in my chest. And um, I would do that until it became my roar, until I realized, oh my gosh, I really am brave. And I think I realized before I even knew what I was doing, that that's the beauty of good fiction. It helps you see you're braver than you thought you were. You're stronger than you thought you were. You've got more story to tell. It doesn't end with one dark spot. That's just the middle of the book. You got to keep going to find out what happens next. So um, I, I recently went to Chicago as part of my new book tour, and I got to see the wardrobe that belonged to C.S. Lewis when he was a kid, the one he climbed into and played in, with his brother. Like, they would climb wow. into this. It inspired Narnia, and I got to open it. I got to check for Narnia. It wasn't in there that day. <laughs> but but it was so magical to think, gosh, this one story that started in somebody's imagination has encouraged people for years and years all over the world. And I'm, I'm one of them for sure. I love that book. Is that why your character in the hummingbird roars when she's it in is. pain? So did it you is. actually roar like out loud when you broke a bone? Oh no, I just screamed. Um, I did not consciously think of it as a roar when I was a kid. That's something I gave Olive. I think in retrospect, looking back, um, you could call it that you're just trying to summon whatever you've got in you to be brave when painful yeah. things happen to you as a kid, you know, but, but I thought I'm going to call it a roar. I think that's what she was doing. So what do you think's the bravest thing you've ever done? Oh, that's a hard question. Because I'm obviously um, living with brittle bone disease is brave, right? But this, but I mean, something that like maybe a, an event or just something you can remember that you're like, I was really brave in that moment. I'm proud of that. So I can think of two things. One, um, in college, I studied in England for a semester 
And that at the time felt like the bravest thing I'd done. It's the furthest I'd been from home, which is scary, no matter what kind of body you happen to be living in. But the fact that my body's a little bit more fragile and I thought, gosh, if anything happens, I'm going to be an ocean away from my parents. I'm going to be an ocean away from my orthopedic, like all of this kind of safety net that I'd built. I was really, really far away from it. And I was totally fine on that trip. Um, and it was physically challenging, but so rewarding. I loved it. Um, so I'm really proud of that one. And then not physically, the other thing that I'm proud of was years ago when I started querying my first novel. Um, if you or any of your listeners love to write, you already know like one part of actually getting traditionally published is finding an agent. And so you send out a query letter and it is just a landslide of rejection for most people for most of the time. And i I hate rejection. Who doesn't, right? Like I do so many things in my life to avoid the feeling of rejection. Yeah. But I thought if this big dream is actually going to happen, I've got to get over myself and actually put my words out there. And it was terrifying and it did get rejected, but eventually it also found a great agent and publisher and worked out. So um, I'm really thankful. Every time I've roared, it's paid off. How many times did you send out that letter before you got accepted? I, so people do this so many different ways. Some people send out tons of letters all at once. I did it in very small batches because I thought if I got feedback that resonated, I could um, work on my book a little bit more. So I think I sent out like three and I got full requests on all of them. This was for a snicker of magic and I was so excited. Um, and it took a long time for them to read it. They all got back to me with notes, but no offers of representation. And so I was just about to rewrite the whole thing, but I had just sent one to another agent who loved it. Um, we made a few editorial changes before she actually sent it to publishers. But that said, I know that doesn't sound like very many. I had tried once before and it was unanimously rejected the book I sent out at that time. I'm thankful for this now. It wasn't my best work, um, but, but it's hard. Rejection is tough and it comes in some form as you continue writing, or I'm sure you've experienced this as a podcaster, anytime you put your work out there um, and the public gets to hear it or rate it, there's that little bit of rejection you feel when someone doesn't like it. Because, I mean, everybody likes different things. It's all subjective. So, um, but it's all worth it. Yeah, no, you're right. I think the internet is especially cruel these days. You can you can say oh, a lot gosh. of things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so mean. And I don't even know if people would say the things they do in person, but there's something about that anonymity a screen gives people that, and it's sad. I think there's a lot, and I'm not just talking about people who don't like it. I mean, there are plenty of books I read that I, I don't like either, but um, the just oddly cruel comments are the yes, ones that make the me, vicious, what was yes. going on in your heart the day that happened. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes you're like, does this person not have a life? Like, are they just on YouTube binding videos to criticize? <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, but uh, Natalie, I want to be respectful of your time. I want to ask you one more question. You know, you're s talking about, and we've been talking about how your characters are always at the end in some form kind of finding out where they belong and they're finding out their identity. You know, if you had to pick a word to describe you at this season of life in this time, you know, from the time you've been a kid to now, you know, what word would you pick that you think describes Natalie Lloyd the best? I love that question. Every year I try to pick a new word and kind of make it my word for the year. The word I had picked for this year, it's not the one I'm going to pick for your question, but the word I had picked for this year was wingspan because I wanted to see creatively how far I could stretch myself. Um, and that seemed like a good way to think about it. But I think my word for myself in this season would be the word firefly. Um, because I am finally figuring out how to shine in a way that's mine. And it's a very tiny little light, um, but it's mine. And, and I'm proud of it. And I'm really happy where I am. This is a good season that I'm in. Well, Natalie, I love that. Maybe that'll be a title of another magic book. Oh, maybe. That would be cool. <laughs> I love that word. 
<laughs> but Natalie, thank you so much. And for listeners, I will have a link to her website. Please, please read at least even one of these books we've talked about or her new book because you will not regret it. They're they're wonderful books. I love them. I and my friend specifically who told me about it, she'll listen to this. She's gonna be laughing, but you can ask her too. She absolutely loves Natalie Lloyd's books. Oh, um, thank you, friend, for me. Yeah, she, you know, it was funny. I was talking to her the other day, uh, this friend of mine, and she's like, when are you going to interview Natalie Lloyd? And I said, oh, it's upcoming, this upcoming week. And she was like, I, my dream is for her to be my graduation speaker for my master's class. Oh my gosh. I know. Cool. She was like, because she wants to be a children's author. And so your books have been a huge inspiration to her. And so it's just been really cool to see I've just this whole new world opening for me too to see how much children's books impact adults. And I think that's just so neat. Oh, well, I'm grateful I get to write them and grateful y'all would read them. And thank you for what you do. Thank you for sending so many stories out into the world the way you do. I love it. Oh, thank you. Well, Natalie, have a good evening and thanks so much. All right. You too. Thanks again.